Welcome, everybody. Um, I'm glad you're all able to make it tonight. Uh, we look forward to an inspiring uh, evening with Rabbi Schwartz. Um, so, um, first of all, Rabbi Schwartz, I hope you hear us well. I hear you. Can you hear me? I hear you perfectly well. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for joining us this evening and giving up of your time. You know, it's a little hectic, Erev, Erev Pesach, um, and we really appreciate your time, your efforts coming forward. Um, Thank with, you. So we're going to open up the, uh, give the floor to you, and Bezrat Hashem, you know, give you a few minutes, hopefully you give us a, a few words of chizuk. We appreciate Praise it. Praise Hashem, Mitzvah. We'll give, a, we'll give it a try. Now, Pesach is obviously a very... Uh, a rewarding experience for most of us, and for some people, it's also a very stressful experience. And it comes even that when everything is perfect, the conditions at home. And Kalva when uh, we have challenging children at home. So just we need to take a deep breath at a time. It's already, a, you know, a good idea to start taking those breaths because we're going to need to take them probably every day from now until Pesach, including all the days of Pesach, um, that it's a really, really big, big challenge. But hopefully we'll we'll try and make it, at least give some guidance how to make it a bit easier. First, as uh, I was planning to do, was give a little Dvar Chizuk maybe with specifically for, for the type of homes that uh, many of the people who are involved here have challenging children. So the Haggad already uh, already was Makdim Rufuala Maka, because Bohu uh, the Torah envisions this happening, predicts this is gonna happen. And we mentioned the God Boruch Hamokum Bohu, Kinegadarba Bonik Diba Torah. Because Bohu told them right when they came out of Mitzrayim, there's an avoider here. You have to bring a Korban Pesach, you have to eat matzahs, you have to tell the story. And you have to pass it from door to door, and you have to keep it alive and relevant. It's the heart and the shom of Klausel's Yitzis Mitzrayim. And then the Torah says, That posuk in the Chumash, That's the posuk which is relating the question of the Russia, Ben HaRosha. And the Torah starts it out with saying, V'hoyo, V'hoyo, ki yomu aleichem b'neichem ma'avoyda zoizlochem. Hazal Darshan, very interesting, Ein v'hoyo elo loshen simcha. V'hoyo, with a vov in the beginning, always indicates simcha. Loshen of a Rebbe, the Eish Dos, uh, who was a going in Nigla, Nister, Machadish, Godel, Kola, Kula. He says, What was this to be so happy about? This is the Pasuk which introduces the question of the Russia. What's there to be happy about? So it's a good question. And they got this right up. They came out of Mitzrayim. And they're all enthusiastic. And they have, you know, a spark in their eyes, and they're ready to be to eternalize Klai as the way as the way it should be done. And then they're informed: you're going to have a chokhem, you can have a tam, a nidah and a rosha. But the besura that they're going to have children. Where did they know they're going to have children? Maybe they'll all perish in the desert. Maybe they'll all come to Eretz to be wiped out. No, v'hoyo ki yom aleichem b'neichem. As I'll dash at that moment, Amiso, like it says in the end of the Posuk, Vayikoid ha om vayishto ibishta habush. The Amiso heard when the Kadam is saying, Hashem says, Vahoyo kiyonlu alechem benechem. Your children, meaning your children and your children, will ask you, Oh, we're going to have children. There's going to be a hemshek for Klai Yisrael. They were so happy. Vahoyo. They were filled with simple, We're going to have children. There's going to be a continuity. There's going to be an ongoing conduit which we can pass 
this experience through and be manziach to eternalize the, the Torah, to eternalize the Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim. So, they bowed down. They were so thrilled. They were so happy. What do you think? You're going to have uh, children who are some of them will be Rishon. Now's the time to thank the Rabbani Shalom and to be happy. The Ozhirov says, Kedarka Vakodesh De Ishtar says, Yeah, but Akrish Bohu doesn't leave anybody behind. And this is a tremendous chizuk. Akrish Bohu is Choshev Machshovis Tomi Nevilti Yidach Mimenu Nidach. Nobody gets left behind. And even has to show them, not that our children are showing has to show them, but there's a message here. When we have a suffix, whether our seed, our eternity is going to, is, is, has a, if we have any future. Because Bohu says, you're going to have a children. You're going to have children. Some of them are going to be challenging, but don't worry. Because Bohu is, because Bohu is, because Bohu is, Nobody gets left behind. Get gets left behind. If not now, tomorrow. If not tomorrow, five years from now. If not five years, ten years, twenty years from now. And if not in this lifetime, in another, in another lifetime, in a Gilgal. If not them, then they're bonim. They're they're bnei bonim. And nobody's lost. This is Marumas. I want to add on to the Ozhavov, Not that he needs any uh, tosefes. The pasuk that comes to answer the ben arosha. He's asking a question, it's almost like the Chochim. And what's the answer? The next posting says, So we answer him, this is a Zebach Pesach Hashem, that everybody was killed in Mitzrayim except us. The Mitzrayim were killed. And we were not killed. We were saved. But it doesn't say we were saved. It says, botenu Our homes, our families, he saved. And this is a basura. This is the basura toiva. This is the good news that Akush Bokh was telling Ami. So this pasuk, which says you can have children, even some will be Rishoyim. Not that our children are Rishoyim, Chas Rishoyim. But even if you'll have Rishoyim, Akush Bokh will promise, Ves botenu hitzil. I will save your family. Nothing is for naught, to use a double negative. Nobody is lost. The family will remain. And that's our goal in the Leila Seder and in the whole year. And everything we do in Avodah Hashem is ves botenu hitzil. Save the home. Save the Jewish home. As long as we have them at home, he will not get lost. Interestingly, uh, interestingly enough, though, this is not the answer that the Baal HaGodah tells, tells us to give him. We give him a different answer. But before we get to the different answer, we have to ask our question, ask ourselves a question. Why is this Russia sitting at my table? Why is, if he's such a Russia, why is he coming to the Seder? Well, we we can understand this in the following way. Akurish Bohu responds to this, to us. They will always have a desire to belong to the home. If you don't, if you don't throw them out and you don't mess up completely. The one thing left is the bias, is the home, is the family. He'll come, he'll sit there. He may ask a challenging question. And that's the next lesson the Balagoda teaches us. When somebody asks a question, when our children ask questions about Avodah Hashem, we have to understand where is the question coming from. And with the Ben Arosha, the question is coming from, I don't feel I belong to this. The Yushalmi says his question is, why are we working so hard? Why is there so much tircha? Why is this so expensive? Why are we going out of our minds and our bodies to fulfill these mitzvahs, which I don't feel I belong to them. And if a person doesn't feel he belongs, he certainly will not be able to handle the effort that's involved in keeping those mitzvahs. So the, the goal of, of challenging children and all the children 
at the Leila Seder is Ves Botenu Hitzil, to help him feel he belongs. Therefore, we answer to the Rosha that the Balagoda says, we give him a different answer. It's all about belonging. I'm sorry, you don't feel that way. So your question comes with tightness because you don't feel you belong. Maybe if you listen to the story tonight, if we open our hearts, we'll find a Pesach. We'll find a Pesach that you'll be able to feel that you belong. And that's that's really the soul of all of our batim is to help all of our families, is to help them feel that they belong. So let's uh, get in a little bit into the halachic part. Before we get into the halachic part, uh, I want to say that in order to avoid the best, the best, uh, you know, solution to any problem is to avoid it. So well, it's uh, really. Is somebody asking a question? Uh, so the, I'm hearing some feedback from somebody. I don't know who it is. So the 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 most important thing is, if possible, would be to. Uh, have a sit down together with if there are any kips at home. We're talking about kips, obviously, uh, and talk about Pesach. Pesach is coming up. We're already in the midst of the cleaning up. What is it? Now is your chance to ask the question, not them asking you. What is it about this period and the holiday that's coming up that you find very challenging? And take notes and be aware of it. We we want to give them the possibility to feel they belong. So if there's parts of it they feel is very challenging, that's the the part they won't be able to handle because anyway they feel they don't belong. They're disconnected, these children. So why would they want to take any burden upon themselves if they don't have to? So it's important to know what are their triggers and that you can only get directly from them. With a compassionate and, and, and sincere conversation with them, what is it about? What we're going into this period is going to be challenging for you. As far as the Leila Seder is concerned, also, any parts of it you feel you can't handle, you don't want to be here, it's fine. We don't have to put any pressure on them. Ki to sit at the Seder table. Nothing. You tell, we tell them, you're, we'd be delighted if you come to the Seder. We don't want you to feel bad. We don't want you to feel estranged. We don't want you to feel like a stranger. Or if there's something that triggers you, you are completely free to do whatever you need to do to enjoy the Yom Tov. We want you to enjoy yourself. We want to enjoy the Yom Tov. If there's anything here that's not good, that's going to in, in, interfere with that, Gesundheit, hey, do what you need to do. The second uh, cloud, which I'm going to be uh, following tonight, as I think many of you already know it, is uh, Pesach is a time of humorous. Pesach is the time when we look to be medactic and mitzvahs. Ah, you could say Pesach uh, is also b'mashu and dikdukim and hidurim and minhagim. That doesn't work for somebody who feels he doesn't belong. Halavai the biyotz the ikaradim. So we have to adjust our minds that the goal of this Pesach is not to be yotza all the enyonim. That cannot be our goal. If that will be our goal, Pesach is so confusing and so stressful, even to people who have no issues, we'll lose them altogether. We'll take away, what we'll be doing is taking away the possibility of an avoid of a, of a, we'll call it a, 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 a ceremony that can help them feel they do belong on some level. And the chumras uh, will will absolutely destroy that possibility. So whatever halakha questions you have, which I'm going to open the the, uh, session up to anybody who has questions, I will always give the most lenient opinion possible, bona fide lenient opinion, because we have to remember the goal is vesboteinu hitzil, the spoh who's guiding us, Save your family. That's the Hatzol of Klausel. And the reason that we have a challenge in the family is because somebody, one or more of them, feels they don't belong. So our goal is to help them feel that they belong. Okay, any questions? There okay. was some question in, in writing there that I, I don't know, it disappeared. I don't know where it went It's to. in the chat. Um, let's, you know, okay, let's, let's go to this one first. Um, 
where to go. Let me find it. Can I see it also? Or, or? Should be able to. I believe it had to do with a child in um, for Pesach. They will be at a hotel uh, for Pesach, and they want to know how the best way to help handle their child in pain um, in a hotel in Pesach, in public, in a public setting. In other words, I think the question is more in line. Um, do we worry about how they're going to walk around, how they're going to handle themselves in a public setting? Is that something that we have to worry about? And how do we handle it? Well, it's a great uh, uh, opportunity for avoidance of midas. Because it, it, one of the big things that we have to help our children feel is that we're not embarrassed from them. Uh, so, you know, I'm not saying a person should actually go around uh, uh, asking their child to do something that would be embarrassing to them. But if they do so, you need to prepare, prepare yourself ahead of time that they may be challenging in the way they behave in public. And uh, on some level, it's not the only reason they do it, but on some level, they're testing you. So it's an opportunity to work on your midas, to work on your humility. It should be a kapora for you if you feel any embarrassment. And then you have to work on your, your internal oilum, your panemius, that uh, I have to help this child who's in so much pain feel they still belong and still be loved and still are part of us. So if you challenge them in any way or making demands to them how they appear publicly, you're gonna lose that. You're gonna lose that and it could turn into a catastrophe. So I would suggest uh, before you go, you do a lot, a lot of internal work, a lot of avoidance and meters. My child, yes, is going to challenge me, likely to challenge me. There will be scenarios that are likely going to be embarrassing for me. And I'm preparing myself ahead of time. It should be a kapor for whatever I need a kapor for. And it should help me acquire the maila vanova of humility. And avas Yisrael amitis, to love my child with, with no preconditions. If you can do that in a public setting, uh, you have a good chance of creating a bond with your child that's already a challenge bond. So the bond is weakened when the children get into this stage. Uh, it's an, a, a wonderful opportunity to help repair that connection. So, you know, the way the question was worded, how do I handle my kid? Don't handle your kid. Don't handle them. Just be there for them. You know, get over your, your the monkey on your shoulder, so to speak. And if she or he comes out in a challenge way, go right in front of everybody and give them a hug and a kiss and get over it. Um, I'm going to interrupt Arizona that asked the question. I'm in the car with my kids and I can't elaborate, but in a couple of minutes, I'm going to be able to give specific details why I asked. Um, can you repeat that? Because we had a little trouble hearing you. I said that I, I was the one that asked the question, but I'm in the car with my kids, so I need to wait a few minutes to elaborate on it. Okay, so just in the in the chat, just let me know, and we'll try to get you back on. Thank you. Okay. Hmm. Okay. Next question that came in: What do I do if my married kids will not go along with the kips? <laughs> Just going to ask everybody to please mute yourselves. Yeah, there's a lot of disturbance. Yeah, let me see if I can mute everybody again. Um, okay, there we go. Okay, so married, married children, uh, really, that's a very complicated issue, and it's the same same recipe or same uh, idea that I said before, you need to have a meeting with them ahead of time with the married children and prepare them what may happen at the Seder table, what they need to be prepared for could happen. If they're not comfortable with it, especially if they have their own children, you tell them you are perfectly entitled and we respect it and we, we even want you that you should make your own decision if you want to be here or not. So give them uh, 
they have a legitimate concern for themselves. They have to take care of themselves. And you have to take care of your family. And if the, they view the two as uh, mutually exclusive, then they should not be at the Seder. But of course, they have to make their own opinion, uh, their own, own decision, but they need to be well informed ahead of time. So sit down with both of them, the daughter or daughter-in-law, the son, the son-in-law, and have that conversation well ahead of the night of the Seder. Okay. Um, the next question. Okay, so this one is a little, you know, a little bit more in depth. Um, okay, so my son doesn't keep Shabbos and the Chagim. With Pesach coming up, I need advice on how to handle the situation in case he somehow gets access to chametz and eats it in my, in my house in front of us or privately in his room. Okay, very good question. Yes. Okay, so, so let me talk. Let me talk about chometz in general uh, in the house. Bor Hashem, the Torah says lo yire lo yiroi lo chometz. So, or you shouldn't be have chometz that's in your possession, but it's mean your chometz. You shouldn't see. You shouldn't have in your shoes your chometz. But if it's not your chometz. Then mid there's no issue. There's their abundance. But let's say in this case where your your child, who's a god, not a young child, he's he's bar bar bas mitzvah, he has chomits in the room, has So the first thing you need to do is when you sell your chomits ahead of the ahead of time, you make sure the, the rough who's selling chomits understands you're selling the entire room, which is Mamela, the rough should understand, but you designate the room, write that in the star. Plony Almoni's room is included in the Mechiras Chomets. You are selling that room. So that means you don't have to be buried for that room. Even if you only sold it on Yudalit on the 14th of Nisan, uh, you still don't have to uh, check that room. If the child, you, you speak to the child, again, here also, you speak to the child ahead of time. You know, we don't have Chomets in the house on Pesach. I'm selling your room. There's anything forgotten there or whatever, I'm selling it. It's your responsibility. Now, you as a parent or anybody else in the house is not allowed to walk into that room. So I would ask them the, the, the child ahead of time. Uh, if you leave the room, when you come out of the room, don't say if you leave the room. That sounds like you don't want them to leave the room. When you leave the room, can you just please lock the door? Just please lock the door because we have to make a separation between us and the homies. And because all year we may be used to going in and out of the room, we might forget. And we shouldn't be in the room with access to chomets that belongs to a yid. Boy, for that matter. So, again, sell the room. First of all, let's start from the beginning. Speak to the child ahead of time. Remind them, please, we, don't, we can't have chomets in the house. Can you please accommodate us with that? Your room is your, your issue. It's your deal. I'm relinquishing. I'm selling all my rights in that room. So a goy, you can live there. That's your 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 issue. It's your place. You can live there if you want, but I'm selling it. And that means I don't. I'm not going to check it. I'm not going to interfere with you. I'm not going to walk into your room, etc. Please don't leave your room with comrades. And whenever you leave the room, you're not there. Lock the door. Uh, if that causes a big problem, you should contact me privately then. But everything is. It becomes a lot easier if you talk about it ahead of time in a nice, understanding, considerate way. From a lucky perspective, they should not be eating chomets in your house, but in their room, it's not your responsibility. Okay, so as an add-on part of that question, if you, as the parent, happen to have an extra freezer that you use to store Pesach thick of food in that room, they should not do that this year. No, not, a, not a great idea. Not a great idea. Uh, technically, maybe there's some room to be made on it, but I, I, I would suggest on Dafka on that to be Mahmer. Either take the freezer out of the room, take the freezer out of the room, or find yourself another place to hold your, your Pesach. So. Sure. Okay. Seder. Okay, so let's go here to the chat. 
Um, when we ask our kid we can, uh, what we can do to make Pesach more comfortable to him, he just responds, you are just trying to manipulate me into coming to the Seder. So I guess the question is, how do we respond to that statement? Well, what, what initiated the statement? When we ask our, our child what we can do to make Pesach more comfortable for them, he responds, you are trying to manipulate me into coming to the Seder. Meaning he feels that you're trying to manipulate. He doesn't want to come to the Seder. That's what it sounds like to me, that he doesn't want to come to the Seder. You're asking him, hey, what can we do to make things more comfortable throughout? I the see. Right, I see. And he's so feeling she- that you're manipulating. He's being manipulated into coming into the Seder. So all, what you should, should do, like we said already before ahead of time, is if you don't want to come, it's fine. We'd love to have you there. But if you don't want to come, it's fine. I don't want you to feel uncomfortable, feel guilty, do what's good for you and mean it. I mean, does any parent want their challenging kid to be sitting there at the Seder, shooting arrows, you know, virtual arrows inside at everybody around him and suffering the whole night through and just creating more anger and antagonism? Who would want that? So when you tell them it's okay if you don't come, I understand if you don't come. You can say it with sincerity because there'll be not, nothing good will come out of it. That's why it says in the uh, Rashi brings on the Chumash on that posu of Bavuze also Hashem lead, but says in the time, leave a low low. She do hoya sham loya yoyze, loya kdai lotzes. We answer the Rosh, the Balagod answers the Rosh, not that our children are showing chas v'shalom, just bringing a, a, a lesson from here. The Torah answers the Rosha. So if you would have been there, you, it wouldn't have been worthy. It wouldn't have been worth it to take you out because since you feel detached, since you feel you don't belong, what would be the point of bringing you into the Am Yisrael? You don't feel you belong to them. The same is true of the Allah Seder. If you feel you don't belong, you don't have to be here. Do want to be here? I can share with you my experience, my feelings. I can just share with you what I experienced. But if you feel you don't belong, I don't want you to suffer through it. Oh my God! Hey, okay. um, follow up to the question before about the hotel. The hotel question. No, everybody's me. Um, please, one second. I see we have some little background noise. Um, okay, so we need to be there. The, these people need to be at the hotel because our husband has a job in the hotel. They at the people at the hotel told her that her daughter needs to be dressed appropriately. She said she'll comply, though she's not happy about it. She'll do the best that she can. What do I do if, if her daughter does not comply? If they're part of the staff, so they're expecting her to accommodate. Who's they? The employers or the guests? The employer, the, it sounds to me that the employers are expecting the child to accommodate the hotel guests. And the question is, I guess, as a parent, how do we explain that to our daughter? Um, how old is she? That is a good question. If you can give me an age of that of the daughter, that would be very helpful. See if she responded. Fifteen. I would I would leave it to leave it to the employer. Tell tell the employer, you know, you know, we have, obviously the employer knows this already. They have a that they you have a daughter that's may not be dressed appropriately. Is that if if that's the case, then you ask the, the employer says, look, the best chance of of uh, her accommodating your wishes is if you bring it up with her in a respectful, nice way. You best best off not it's not uh, dealing with it yourself, because in her mind she'll just think, okay, you know, again, you're you're taking, you're ignoring my needs for your sake. It's all about you. So if you can keep out of it, if you can. Uh, 
get the, the employer to take the job on, but it, you know, stress to him that you have to be sensitive and kind and understanding when you speak to her. He'll have he or whoever's the head of the, the program will have a better chance than you as a parent. Unless you have a fantastic relationship with her, in which case you can tell her the look, I, as far as I'm concerned, you're free to do whatever you like. Um, I know there's some expectations here. If you can fulfill them, it's going to be easier for everybody. But it depends on how her relationship with you. If it's stressed, I wouldn't, it's a hot potato. Let the employer take care of it. And if the employer uh, comes afterwards with complaints that she's not cooperating, you say, say, I told you ahead of time, the best chance of of her accommodating you is from you. It's not going to get better than this. And you'll have to bear the consequences. The employer doesn't have to counsel your child. The employer is an employer and he has expectations. And uh, it's not his job to be a counselor. He should just mention it to her. That's all. He's an employer. He should, the, the child probably understands that her father's employed by this man. She may begrudgingly uh, comply, and she, she may not. Okay. Um, okay, so here's a question, um, probably more pertaining a little bit more in Israel. Um, but as far as kidney is concerned, over the course of Pesach. Um, the child would like to eat kidney oat food, and they would like to have the possibility of putting up, let's say, uh, a cholin pot or some kind of stew with kidney oat for the child. Oh, I would definitely let them do that, uh, because otherwise the next step would be homies. I mean, so, so at that point, it's like, so if it, we're talking about a child, of course, who is not um, Shomer. Uh, to begin with, uh, of course, let me uh, stress that again. Um, so to having a, to be more specific, to be correct, so to have a, um, let's say a crock pot or a pot set aside specifically for kidney purposes, that for this child would be okay. Best botenu hitzil, save the home. Get them the crock pot, the kidney is crock pot and let them do what they want. Okay, next question here in the chat. How do you manage a Seder with a kip who is- By the way, let me just add on to that. If by any chance something gets kibyoho trafed up, that they use the kli, a pesakli, one of your pesakli for the kidneys, but the effort you can still use the kli. You don't have to go bananas and crazy and pasturing. Excellent, okay. So now we have a, uh, a Seder with a child who is smoking weed and has taken Yiddish guy to the extreme and asks philosophical questions all night, but calls his brother who is a kip, who's not keeping Shabbos, but trying to grow and stop doing drugs. So we have a child who is keeping Shabbos, calling the um, child in pain who stopped taking drugs a Russia. And he wants, to, and the Russia who wants to be at the Seder, I'll bite a quick one. They want to do the quick Seder. We need to keep calm for sure. We also have other teens in learning. What can we do? Um, they need advice as, you know, walking on eggshells in order to keep a peaceful Seder. Wait, so let, let me get the, uh, the family set up again. There's one child who is. He is taking Yiddish guy to the extreme. Okay. The pod, in a sense, the positive way, where he's very, very forefront, except he is smoking weed himself. Okay. The second child, who would be, we would call a kip, a child in pain, who is not Shomer Torah Mitzvah, but still wants to be at the Seder. The forefront boy is calling the kip a, a Russia. He's calling him the Russia. They're trying to keep this Seder peaceful as possible. How do we get the two to work together? But the, what, the one who's from, you say, he stays up at night and talks to his brother on philosophical questions? He, the, the from brother who smokes weed, um, asks many, many philosophical questions. Um, 
He'll, he'll ask questions all night long. But at the same token, he's calling his brother a Russia. Ah, but who's he asking the philosophical questions from? It sounds to me he's just asked, he would ask questions. Uh, if we can be more specific on that question, the one who asked the question, um, who does the brother that asks the philosophical questions, who does he ask them to? Okay. And and is he younger or older than the kid? If they answer. Uh, is this the one? Okay. Okay. Let me let me just give it. It sounds like a very complex. It uh, sounds like the from one is is also himself in severe pain. To us, to the family, to everyone. Uh, and who, so wants, asked, who wants asked, the shorts later? Who wants the shorts later? Who asked for it? He is. Um, he is twenty one, and the kip is eighteen. Uh, and they both want a short stater? Do they want a short sweater? Um, let's see. No. So who said they wanted the fast version? I think that was the last question. Okay. Uh, it, it, let me just address that first. I don't know who asked the question about the fast version. The 18-year-old the wants the fast version. Okay. So here's just a, a practical setup. Again, you have a talk with each one of them separately because it sounds like it may be too challenging to talk to them ahead of time. So we can run the Seder in a, a way that hopefully will be okay for everybody, not perfect. Everybody can have their own matzahs, their own three matzahs. And the minute you want to drop out of the central Seder, it's too long for you. You don't feel you connect to it. Take your Haggadah. Finish up what you need to do on your own. You have your own three matzahs. Food is available in the kitchen. If you want, uh, you know, we can uh, uh, we can even uh, you know make sure that there's food put on the table ahead of time. Whatever's necessary so you can keep your Seder as you want it. So it, to try and balance everybody's needs in such a scenario it sounds to me close to impossible. Unless... They both want it, and they both want a quick seder. Then you should do a quick seder, and then after the seder, you can continue. You can be married with whoever wants to be married. Go back to the story and say over whatever you want to say, the verb or whatever the pshatim midrashim, whatever you want. But if you if if one wants a long one, one wants a short one, one wants embellishments, the other one doesn't. Everyone should be made. They can be sitting at the same table. You can join together at certain parts wherever they want. They can come in and out as they feel is good for them. The main thing is they can get to the food and eat the matzah and drink the curses when they want to do it. So they can separate out at any point in time. Okay. Uh, you know, while we we're on that, while you were discussing that topic, so there's um, Avi Fischoff, he discusses it many times. He talks about the, the fascinator where, you know, you come to the table, you get there, and Within 30, within 30 minutes, we get to the food. So there are certain parts of the Seder that are that you have to discuss, that you have to read, and there are other parts that maybe you might be able to skip over or say under your breath or quietly. Are there parts of that initial part of the Seder that is meteorite that has to be said and which parts could we theoretically skip over and come back to maybe during the meal? Well, if you look at the text, the text is not long. Just read it without any embellishments. It shouldn't take more than 15 minutes. Try ahead of time. Just read the words. Like you're davening. It, it, there shouldn't be any need to leave out anything. If a person has to leave out for himself for whatever reason, so he asks the questions, he asks, give the answer of what he means to the paro, then he skipped to what are the, the three things that we have to eat and why do we have to eat them when you make the brochas? And hollow, of course. Hollow. Okay. Um, Just like with the little children. You, you, uh, they ask the manishtana, you say, avodim a yinu lepar b'mitzrayim, and finish them, we give them food. 
then we give them food. So if it's an adult, he has a little more chiyuvim because he's got the Dalek choices. So he says the Dalek choices and he has to say the halo. He has to say uh, that we eat the Pesach al Shumzeh and the Matz al Shumzeh and the Mor al Shumzeh and make the brochus to halal and then he, then he eats the food. But it should, it, I wouldn't uh, recommend that. It would just say it quickly. Okay. Excellent. Okay, so we have a follow-up question when you discuss about not entering the child's room on Pesach. You know, the one may have uh, the eating chametz in their room. So the question came out there, if you're not allowed to enter the room of that child, how can you have attachment or NKN bonding? Sometimes you want to have a you know, long conversation and it usually happens in the child's room. Can you still not enter the room even though they may have chametz in that room? You cannot enter the room when there's chametz there. Unless it's, like, unless it's closed in their cabinet. And they, and they put, a, put a note on it, chametz. You need a, a, a hacker, you need a mechitza in front of the chametz. You can't walk into the room if there's open, uh, you can see their chametz. Okay. Should, if they have chametz, they have to put it away somewhere. Otherwise, you can't go into the room. Okay, uh, trying to see if I can read, read this next question. You, you can knock on the door, you can say, come on, let's have a schmooze. But Try to, to go that. in when the chomets is, is hanging around all over the place in the room, you can't do. Okay. Um, okay, I think you answered this question about the kidney. Oak. Um, okay, so that was answered. Okay. So back to the other question where about the employer um, telling the child not to, um, with the employer should mention that the child should dress more sneeze, the employer has no interest in counseling your, uh, somebody here says that the employer has no interest in counseling your child. I think we'll just leave that one out. Well, again, I, I would, you're an employee, if you're an employee, if it's the mother, the father, they have to go to the, the employer and say, listen, I tell you the truth, I have very little chance of, of getting my child to comply with all of your wishes. If that's going to be a problem, uh, I guess we'll, we'll, we won't be able to work here next year. But uh, there's nothing I can do about it right now. Okay. There's nothing I can do about it. And there, there is a good chance that if you approach my child respectfully, then tell them it's important for, for your business. And we may the child that sounds important for the father, for his employment, and leave it at that. I mean, she's there's nothing more you can do. I've definitely, if she wants to be there, all this is if she wants to be there. If she doesn't want to be there, send her somewhere else. For goodness sake, why, why get this, this sticky situation? Yeah, okay, got it. Okay, um, is there a way, would the rough have a, a way of phrasing to, for, for a child who doesn't live at home, for a kid who does not live at home, and they're very welcome to come and join and be a part of the you know, Pesach experience in their, in, in their parents' house, is there a way to say, please leave the chametz outside the door when visiting? But you Can know the you, you suspect they're going to bring hummus into your house? Correct. Do you want to tell them ahead of time, please don't bring hummus? Is there a nice way of saying it that would not make the, feel, the child feel uncomfortable by coming to the house to visit? Well, you pat it a lot. You know, so we, we can't wait for you to come. We love you when you're here. We're all expecting and enjoying and everything. If the, you're just, it's nerves that you're saying, don't bring homemates. It's just your nerves. Don't say it because the child's not a fool. The child grew up in your house and knows that homemates is also on Pesach. If they're coming to make a statement and they're coming to challenge you, then you just tell them, look, 
we can't have chomets in the house. We'd love to have you, but we can't have chomets in the house. And say, okay, then I'm not coming. So I'm, well, can we meet outside then, say? Can we meet somewhere outside? So it depends on what the, what, where, where the chashash is coming from. Again, if you're just nervous, they're going to do it. Put it aside. If they come with a box of donuts to the door, so that you tell them, please, we cannot have chomets in the house. We'd love to have you. Can you just put it back in your car where it came from? Okay. So it depends if, if there's a reasonable chashash, they're going to bring chomets, then you should preempt it. If there's not a reasonable chance they're going to bring chomets, don't say anything. If they show up with chomets at the front door, ask them if they can please leave it in the car. But don't let him in the house with it. Okay, so we have another question here in the chat. Um, unless, unless they're coming with a, a goy, like a, a, a child will come with a goyish friend, so then there will be an aid to tell the, the, the Jewish, give it to your goyish friend, give it to him, and you're allowed to let a, believe it or not, you're allowed to let a goy come in your house and even eat chomets, but not eat, you can't do that. Okay. So we asked a question earlier about the kidneys to a child who's we call the child in pain who's no longer um, Shomer and Torah Mitzvahs. But as far as we know, the child is still Shomer Shabbos. Can we still offer this child kidneys? Or do we need to wait for him to ask us first for more food options? But the, the child is Shomer Shabbos, so he's... Keeping mitzvahs. So we asked we asked the question about the kidneys for the child who is no longer Shomer right, Torah. Right. This is another question. As far as they, as the parents understand, their 15-year-old child is still Shomer Shabbos. Can they, and they see that the child is still in a lot of pain. Do we, and is acting out, but is still holding on with the threat. Can they still, can they offer him kidneys, this child, the 15-year-old child, can they still offer them kidneys as an additional food item, or do they need to wait until asked? Uh, we wait till they're, be at, till, till they're asked, but what they can offer them is you, you can buy anything that has a, a reasonable hechsher, you know, not, not a conservative or reform hechsher, you know, an orthodox hechsher. If you want anything like that for yourself, because into hate, we're not, for you, we're not makbid on the bedatze de charedis or shevitz or avruban or whatever the hechsher might be. Get whatever you like for yourself. That's what I'm just okay. Um, or you can buy it for them. You don't have to, they don't have to get it themselves. You can buy it for them. Anything that has a extra on it for Pesach that doesn't have kidneys in it, go ahead and buy it for them, even though you wouldn't need it yourself. Okay. Now the truth Here's is, the let me just elaborate on that. Truth is. Depends on the amounts of the child. If the child is really in a, you know, depressed, still not coming out of the room, disconnected, uh, um, they have a din of a choyle. So once they have a din of a choyle, they're allowed to eat kidneys. So if your uh, understanding of this, the child's situation now during Pesach is, they're, yeah. really, they're really, really low, and they they. It could impact them very negatively if they have a hard, hard experience on Pesach. Okay. Adina, no, they have to. Uh, Please mute. keep your phones on. Keep your things on mute. Thank you. So, if the kids in a, a uh, uh, even a moderate. Oops, one second. We just happened here. Rabbi Schwartz, please unmute yourself. I think you accidentally got muted yourself. I think we accidentally muted you. Okay. Uh, again, if the child is in from a moderate to severe situation of depression or anxiety of anger, they have a dean of a choyle and you can give them kidneys. If they're do if they're stable and doing well, they're just still kips, then I wouldn't offer them the kidneys, but you don't have to be moiche if they do want the kidneys. Okay. Um, this just in. 
Um, if my child has exhibited suicidal attempts or ideation, can I, can I, or should I look away from the concern of going into their room when they have open chametz in their room? I think we yes. said, I yes. think you answered that. Then you walk into the room. Then walk into the room. Ah. Okay. So if they have, if they're showing exhibiting suicidal attempts or they're, 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 there's a possibility that you're nervous about their safety, walking go in the room. Walk in the room is not an issue. Okay. So that was a follow up, I believe, to the question that we asked before. Okay. Here's another one. Um, the kip we know is the child is definitely eating um, chametz uh, outside the house, 100%. Do we have to worry about this child now coming into the house, not with the chametz, but worried about the chametz being on their hand or being, um, you know, they're going to come in, they're going to eat with your kalim, and, you know, there's chametz in the mouth. Do we have to worry about, do we need to ask them to wash their hands, to rinse out their mouth? No, you don't have to, you don't have to worry about their mouths, but if they, uh, if you know they ate chametz, and it's, there's crumbs, there's issue of crumbs, so just ask them, please brush yourself off before you go in the kitchen. Okay. And if you feel that it might trigger them to get upset? Apologize. Okay. Chomets is also a filo b'mashu. Even a one crumb of chomets in your big chicken soup pot will make the whole chicken soup that you can't eat it. However, uh, not everybody agrees that chomets is also b'mashu. There's the opinion of the Shi'ultas that chomets is bottled b'shishim. So, uh, in this case, when you have a child, let's say, who might be triggered, what does it mean triggered? Just because they're going to get angry, they might get over it. But if they're going to be triggered and use your choshish by being by them being triggered, they're going to get into a worse situation emotionally. Uh, in other words, they have uh, 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 they're in a matzav where they their emotional state will worsen, not just stay the same, but it will actually make make it worse. Uh, they have certainly a, a din of a, of a choyle. Now, once they got a din of a choyle, and it's only a chashash, we don't know for sure they have chomets on their clothes or on their hands. So, uh, and if they did, so then we could be saying on the sheiltas that chomets is bought to b'shishim. That's a big kula, but we're looking for kulas. Best thing is, if the kid is in a situation where you can say it in a really nice way, sweetie, you know I have a lot of nerves and it's hard, hard for me to uh, stay calm. Can you just brush yourself off before you come into the kitchen? If they triggered them and they didn't do them, they go straight for the pots and start stirring it around. So you can be mako. You can make and eat the food. Okay. Um, okay. A, well, the question that just came in... Um, Verse uh, tobacco, cigarettes, and other type of things. Some say there's a chashash, there may be chametz within this tobacco. Do we have to worry about cigarettes being rolled at the table? Oh, well, I did not check into tobacco or the paper involved in it, but the past this is you don't have to worry about it. But uh, um, I would have to check into that further if there's any chashash chametz in any of those. Uh, not everybody holds it's also to smoke uh, those tobaccos that have chomets in it anyway, but uh, uh, certainly there's a mokum lohoko there, but I, I don't know today if they're doing that. I can check into it if you want. Okay. That would actually would be good. Um, I can definitely re, re, re to send that answer. That would be um, okay. trying to. Make sure we get everybody admitted and at the same time. Okay, so here's a follow-up question um, separately. In the current woke world, everything seems to be okay. No boundaries, no fault. They Even the police are afraid to enforce law and societal order is breaking down. I understand being balanced and reasonable but is there no point where the parent says, this is our home. We love you. 
you are welcome to be with us always. These are our house rules. Regarding the hotel, the father's pranas is at stake. If the kid cannot comply at a basic, decent respect, is the father expected to give up his job? Does Tzirchad Zitzibura not ever come into play? Do we just continuously accept anything and everything? Uh, whoever is asking needs to uh, needs to go go to a Geshe Nafshi or receive the lectures. I think there's a lot of basic uh, basic information missing from uh, reading between the lines. Basic knowledge of how to deal with these uh, with these situations at home. Um, so I don't know how to respond to this other than uh, everything has to be with love and understanding without expectations. And then if there are issues that come up, you need to learn how to solve them together with the child. Uh, in, there's you know enforcement, police, enforcement, rules. You know, I look at the text that's, that's here, are just not going to work. They will not work with a kid. If you want the situation... If you want to end the story, there's no ending the story, but if you want the situation to get worse, uh, then you stay focused on those type of that type of vocabulary of, of uh, uh, enforcement and cops and rules and respect and decency and all that stuff. Uh, I'm not sure when there's, what has to do with anything here because that's something that applies in shul. But um, expectations from somebody who can't deliver the goods means frustration. So you need to reorient, reorient yourself. You need to get a better, a better understanding of what these kids are going through, how to deal with them, how to help them connect. And the best way to get a compliance is developing in them a sense of belonging. And enforcement doesn't create a sense of belonging. Um, I can't go at, at length on this question because I think there's some a certain mindset that's, uh, that needs to be adjusted uh, in order to deal with the situation. But it, if I had to give one answer to all these questions, this is, I would say none of the, none of the points are relevant. Uh, even the last one, do we continuously accept anything and everything? Let me address that for a minute. That for sure not. That for sure not. Dealing with Kips doesn't mean you abandon everything that's important, everything that's precious for you. Doesn't mean that. We have to think about what's really for the good of the child in a way that's not going to hurt other people, in a way that's not going to hurt myself more than it hurts me just because my child is not doing the way the Derek Yisrael Saba. But I have to be concerned with my child and help the child and do what's good for the child and not think about personal needs. My personal wants and desires and what I dreamt about, I have to be willing to put that aside for the sake of to save my child who could as for showing these children can get easily into a matzah of, of, as we had the question before, of suicidal ideation. And from a suicidal ideation to jumping off a roof, has is a very, very, uh, it's not a long distance. Mamish, not a long distance. So the child has to feel we're all there for them. Does that mean that we have to continuously accept anything and everything? No, it does not mean that. And that's a per. It's a terrible idea that so many parents I've heard from that they think this is what you have to do with KIPS. It's not the case. What it does mean is that whenever issues come up that you feel very strongly about, there's a confrontation with a child, you need to ask somebody who's understanding and responsible how to deal with that particular situation in that particular home at that particular time. And the reason you're asking because you want to do the best possible for your child. On the other hand, there are certain as you, rules, certain standards in the house. How do we? How do you make this work? Is there a way to make this work? You, I don't see there's a way to get out of it in these situations without asking somebody who's a, a therapist who understands, a rov who understands, somebody who's been through it already. Um, that's the last part of the question, which is important. That's a big no-no. We do not continuously accept anything and everything. Absolutely not. But you need to ask them, okay, what do we do now? Come in with the cops and the rules and the enforcement and is not the answer.
Okay, we're going to uh, switch a little bit. Um, By the way, about the Panosa, giving up the Panosa, I think the, the person actually wrote in that the employer himself is understanding of these situations and himself, the employer is willing to talk to her. He's extremely understanding. He himself lost a daughter due to overdose. So there you got it. We don't have to worry about the situation. Okay. Um, a single mother uh, will be making Siddharm for the second year alone uh, with her. She's going to be alone with her with her uh, 16 year old daughter. She has been through a tremendous amount of various kinds of abuse and trauma and is currently not in school. She doesn't feel comfortable going to a relative for a Seder or for any meal. She feels mistreated, abandoned and forgotten by people on Hashem. She feels so Hashem took us out of its rhyme but he hates me. Is there a way to answer that question? You know, what can she give over to her daughter? She's going to be the two of them at the Seder. And the daughter feels that it was nice that God took out the Jews out of Mitzrayim because he liked them, but he hates me. Well, of course, it's not a, a Seder issue, but uh, she's putting using the Seder as an opportunity to... Uh, to express how she feels. I don't know how the mother knows this is what's going to happen. Maybe it's happened before. Um, uh, but let her talk. <laughs> Why do you think Hashem hates you? Hashem invited the Ben Harasha to the Seder. Why do you think Hashem would, would hate you? Even the Russian invites to the Seder. But let her talk. And then if you can, you can try and, and show her uh, why these are not reasons why Hashem would hate you. Hashem doesn't hate any Yid. He doesn't hate the Yid. He may hate the things that they do if they do riches, but he doesn't hate the Yid. Hashem will do everything he can to get that person back. The vilti yudah mimenu nidah. The Hashem will do everything in his power, and he's got unlimited power, to bring that Yid back. He hates nobody. When, when we experience somebody who we love does something wrong, it, get mixed up, it gets mixed up in our heads. He's doing something wrong. I disapprove. It angers me. And then we say, okay, then i angry at the person. I ha hate the person. I'm upset with the person. Because Baruch has a great capacity to compartmentalize. So his actions are unacceptable but I love his neshama and I can do everything I can to bring it back. And that's the story of Purim. Amisul was not worthy of being safe based on their deeds. In fact, they may have been guilty even of Hoyt So Hashem brought it back a situation that they would do tshuva because he loves them. If he didn't love them, he wouldn't have brought that situation about. He wouldn't have worked Kivyoho to bring about Esther and the palace and the whole story so that Amisul would do tshuva. Shem doesn't hate any yid. Hates. Of course, the girl obviously needs some kind of therapy, obviously. But it's a great opportunity. It's just the two of them together. Let her talk. Let her say what, why she thinks Hashem hates her and try and break it down. Okay. Um, this is more of a follow-up to a question I think that we previously answered. Um, if you're going to have regular from children... I mean, let me add one other piece to that. Oh, that before... The, Say there's a time to express our course at all. That's what's all. We thank Hashem for taking us out of Mitzrayim. The, the second most important brach in the Shmon essay is Moidin. Moidin Menachem Loch. Shato em elokeinu velkeh avoseinu lo yinom v'yed. Shato Hashem elokeinu elokeh avoseinu lo yinom v'yed. The sentence doesn't make a lot of sense if we don't think about it carefully. You are the father of our fathers forever. Of course, he's the father of our fathers forever. Of course, he's the father of Avram, Mitzvah, and Yaakov forever. You can't take away his fatherhood. We're thanking Hashem, Shatahu Hashem Elokeinu. You are our God and the God of our fathers. We will never, we are never separate from our forefathers. Hashem will never cut off the lineage and say, up till here, I was together with you. From now on, you're on your own. It never happens. Never will happen. Never, ever will happen. We thank you, Hashem, at the Seder 
for promising, guaranteeing to us, no matter what we do, no matter how big or showing we become, because Bohu will always consider us to be the descendants of those who he, who he created the covenant with, Avrom, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, and they're our forefathers. We didn't cut ourselves off. Shem didn't cut, didn't cut himself off. He hates no one. He, in fact, he created a covenant that he will forever be our father, <coughs> having the father of our fathers, and will benefit from that lineage forever, no matter how weak he is. Okay, that, that's beautiful. So we have the conversations with all our children and all those who are going to be um, at our, our table. Do we, or should we, have a specific conversation to let's say our from children and tell them straight out that I intend to change or change the way that I normally do the Seder. I am customizing it specifically this year to the needs of our struggling children. And I understand that if you choose not to come, I'd love to have you there, but I you know, understand that if you choose not to come, do we have that conversation? Or do we just you know, hope that our from children will understand? Oh, just hoping to understand is for sure not gonna happen. You have to have a conversation. I don't think the wording is correct. You have to have the conversation ahead of time. And you say, I would love to run the Seder exactly like we did in years past, exactly in a way that fits you. You know we have challenges here now. And if we want to hold on to Shmer, Ruber, whoever it is in, at our table, we're going to have to make some changes. So I know this is not going to be comfortable for you, but you could be a part of it. You could be part of helping him reconnect, which is a huge mitzvah which the continuity of Amishol is what the Seder is all about. If that's going to be difficult for you, there are two options. One is, I'll give you your own, like we said before, I'll give you your own few matzahs, and you open up to wine, and you can be my eye in, and you can, and you can, you know, if you have another kid who's at the table, you can have, run your own private conversation, and I'll have a separate one with your brother, your sister, or a kid. Or if you like, you can go away. We can set that up for you. Would love for you to stay. Understand if you can't. But the discussion has to take place ahead of time. But he shouldn't feel like you're sacrificing him for the sake of the kid. It's just, I'm. Uh, there's nothing I could do. I have two children. I'm a father of two children. They both have separate needs, different needs. Uh, I can't give you both exactly what you want. We can maybe divide up the Seder. And they have that conversation with the kid also. This part of the Seder, I'm going to be embellishing uh, the, the Haggadah with Verklach. If you want, you can just leave the table at that time. You got to speak with both of them and see if you can work something out. If he's so, so entranced that he can't, he can't handle it and say, well, maybe you'd like to have your brother or sister who's married or something, that's, that's okay. But the, just hope things will work out is for sure a recipe for failure. Uh, let's go with a, um, a simple question that I was asked. Uh, about the mil the most basic minimal shearing for Sadar. You know, it's you want to make it as easy as possible for all the struggling children, you know, to sit there with these big, you know, clumps of matzah that's going to take, you know, 10 minutes or so to eat, you know, to ch chow down. Okay, let me say, everybody overeats on the matzah. This is how much matzah you need to eat, just like this. You have an average size hand, put up your five fingers, Whatever, cover your five fingers like this. That's it. Everybody's eating about five, six times the amount of matzah that they, that they uh, more than they need to. Everybody's overeating. It's a chila gasa, and it could be you're not even yoitza with it. So if you have a small hand, you know, I would say, you know, maybe this is a, 10 centimeters by five, something like that. I don't know, seven by 10 or something like that. Uh, that's it. Just put your hand on the matzah. Take the matzah, put your hand on it. Break off the piece that you've, all your fingers cover. And and, uh, and eat that. Finish again. So basically, an average size hand's worth of matzah is more than a... Yes. And more, you can even do a little bit less than that. So if the child is really struggling, a little bit less than that would be... Here, you know, if you take my hand, go like this, right? 
that's probably about half as much as what most people eat. Of course, it depends on the thickness of the matzah, but basically, you can do it like this. I'll give you another way to measure it. You eat your matzah. If it fill up half your mouth, the matzah would fill up half your mouth, so you got a kazayas there. More than kazayas. Just stop. When, when your half your mouth is full, just stop. Okay. Uh, and don't read any books on the topic with rulers and with this and with that. And he says this much and he says that much. Somebody came and asked the stipler how much matzah you need to eat on the level say Then that's what he did. He had a huge hand, the stipler. And he said like this. He didn't even go into details. There's any of the, uh, the Israelis that are on, online, I think most of them, uh, it's not uh, exact anymore, but it's a little bit more than an Israeli matchbox. You know, those little matchboxes. It used to be the Israeli matchboxes were exactly the size of a kazayas. But now they made them, uh, they're not as thick. The same width, they're not as thick. So a little more than an Israeli matchbox. If you take two crackers, two crackers is a kazayas. Think of a kazayas, a half an egg. How big is a half an egg? Rabbeinu Shalaylam. Cram, cram the amount of matzah you usually eat into a half of an egg. Can you do that? Is anybody, can anybody here do that? Please let me know. Okay. Then you eat them too much matzah. It's true for everybody. Okay. Um, and how about as far as shiri, uh, let's say, they don't like grape juice per se, but it's what you have at your table. I mean, wine, grape juice, as far if as somebody that, can't drink it, you can use Hamar Medina, uh, iced tea, hot tea, <laughs> coffee. The Moshe didn't like Coca Cola so much, but others were making on Coca Cola. And it, the amount, and the amount would be, say, three, four right. ounces. The amount is the same amount, is, uh, yeah, about three ounces. About three ounces. Three and a half ounces. Okay. And I guess 90, 90 cc's. 90 cc's. That's and another thing. People taking these big cups, there's no point in it. Go to the stores, find out. It says on usually on the box how many cc's is in the cup. Buy the smallest one. They have ones that are 90 cc's. They exist. A 90, 100, you can get them. They're tiny. They're not that big. They're about this big. And more? You can do less, than, less than that. You can do a, a 20, 20, 20 less than that. You take an av a bainani type leaf, an average type leaf from the head of lettuce, if you're eating lettuce, that's enough. Okay. That's cool. Not the littlest ones in the center, not the biggest ones on the outside. Medium-sized leaf. Okay, um, a lot more questions just came in, and we're going to try to get to as many as we can. I, I you know, we'll see how much time the Rav is what is able to give to us. Hmm? Okay, so we have a. Oh, I got to find that question. I apologize, but it was the. We asked that one. I'm sorry. We have a question. It's a husband and wife question. Okay. It's a little bit, a um, little off as far as the kip is concerned. However, during their 20 plus years of marriage, you know, they've been married for quite a long time, but over the last number of years, um, one of the spouses, Yiddishkeit, has been slipping a little bit. And it seems to be coming from old stuff from, from the past. This individual, this spouse, um, who seems to be slipping, is similar or the same as we would do if it was our child. You need to go to the therapist for that. You need, obviously, that spouse has some issues from the past that they're carrying with them. And uh, Opening a, an open discussion with them is the best place to start. So, you know, your re relationship with Yiddishkeit is, is changing. It's some, something is something's going on inside you internally. Are you aware of what it is? Maybe 
you can get some help. We, we can get some help. Okay. Certainly not condemning them. But no, it's no. not the same relationship as with a child. But it's coming from the same source. They're carrying some pain, some challenging, uh, probably some abu- some kind of abuse in the background. Okay. I mean, she would... Emotional, other, otherwise, a person doesn't usually just lose his uh, attachment with the Yiddishkeit in the middle of life. Because there's something in there that's eating away at him inside. Okay. If the therapist, in this case, it cons- um, considers the spouse to be a victim of trauma, then would they have a, a, the same din of, of Cholay Nefesh? Depends. It could be. Every situation would be different depending on what's going on in their head. It's possible, yes. Very possible. You know, how, how if, if they're Ba'atzvahs, if they're the depression, the answer is yes, absolutely. Anybody who suffers chronic depression, it has a dina v'choyle, and all the lochas of choyle apply to them. Same thing as if they had a, a an ulcer or a problem with their liver or lungs, whatever it might be. Same applies to the brain. The brain is no different. What does the heart do? It pumps blood. What do the lungs do? They breathe air. What does the liver do? It cleans blood, etc. What do the muscles do? They help move your, your limbs. What does the brain do? It thinks. The brain thinks. So when thinking is off, it means the brain is not healthy. So you have a sick brain. Somebody has a sick brain, has an illness in his brain, he's got a dina v'choyle. Okay. Uh, I see there's, there's a, a, a question about two two kazaisim or one kazayas says you can be makele to to that uh, the, the size that we that you said could be considered too small kazaisim. You want it to be two kazaisim, so you <coughs> have to dub, double that, but you don't have to eat it all at once. <laughs> You can eat this one piece that's like this for the kazayas uh, matzah. You can eat another piece like that for uh, for matzah moro. Okay. <clears throat> um, we have a question here. Um, we kind of sort of answered it when it came with the kidney. Uh, one second. Yeah, with kidneys. But here's a question in regards to kabras, where the one spouse does not want to eat kabras. And the other spouse eats kabrachs, but started eating kabrachs only when they introduced it to the table when they are um, when they were posking that they can have kabrachs at the table for their child, for their kid. Do we have to worry about the kabrach situation? If we're talking about a family, it seems that did not eat kabrachs, but now is eating kabrachs. They should be Whereas, not in leather and they can eat kabrachs then. Go to a rob and get a, a Taurus Nidorim on the menu. And then they can eat the broth. And they don't have to worry about the Kalim as far as in that case. No. Excellent. Well, once they get ahead, once they get ahead, Matin Nidorim, everything is mutter. Okay. Hmm? What? Okay. Okay. Um, now, about buying chametz before Pesach. Okay. It may have been asked, but you know, they don't think it was not asked yet. I'm just letting you know. Is it okay to buy a kit, a child, these kit, our kips, a lot of chametz food before Pesach, knowing that they will be eating it on Pesach? He likes certain prepared foods from the grocery store, and he wants to fill up a freezer of, of Pesach, a non-Pesach the chametz food before Pesach. Okay, but he only asks him to buy him um, that you know food that is kosher. At least, at least the food is kosher. But he's told us he will be eating chametz on Pesach. So he asked to buy him chametz on Pesach. He asked to have. 
before Pesach. But you because know that because he he's going to eat uh, he's going to eat chametz on Pesach. Technically, it's mutter, but I uh, would try and get out of it. Give him money instead. And then let him decide best if he... Thing, yeah, best thing would be give him money. Listen, you know, if you do what's... It's your conscience. It's your relationship with the divine or something. You, you, you do what's wrong. I'm not going to interfere with it. And he says, I can't make it to the store. Tell him, listen, I'm buying this for you now. I hope you won't be eating this on Pesach. That's all. You do with it what you want. But I, I really t- tell him, I encourage you to think about not eating it on Pesach. But as long as it's before Pesach, you can buy him whatever he asks for. Just uh, as an, uh, just for your own conscience, you, you, and maybe it is benefit for the child. He saw you bought it for him. You respect him and say, it would be great if you could manage for one week not to eat this stuff. What if he is in a sakana? Then, then, then feed him chometz on Pesach. Okay. okay. If that's what he needs, you know, you got to ask a, an expert, is, is that going to make the difference? Eating the chometz is going to take him out of Sakona, then you give him the, the chometz. Okay. So somebody who who's, uh, gets a hunger, hunger, uh, the bulmus is called, a, you know, sugar level drops severely on Yom Kippur, you feed him on the spot, you don't ask him any questions. Somebody who is, if you don't, for whatever reason, you don't, he doesn't get his chomets, he's going to jump off the roof, then you feed him chomets. Hard for me to imagine a situation like that, but if it exists, if there's some kind of sophic pikot nefesh involved, uh, let's say it was an alcoholic, and they have to drink whiskey, and if they don't, they're going to jump off the roof, that's pikot nefesh. But you're not, you're not, you shouldn't feed it to him on, on, you, know, on you shouldn't buy it for him or feed him to him on Pesach. It would be better than to get it ahead of Pesach, buy it for them and say, listen, I hope you'll be able to withstand this on Pesach. So if the child, let's say, at this present moment in time is self-harming, <laughs> um, you know, he already has, a, he may have had a friend who committed suicide himself. We're talking about a child um, who's afraid for his life. So therefore, we don't have to worry about the per buying him the chametz beforehand for sure. No problem. We should buy him whatever he needs, and not just give him the money. You could, it, it's better if he buys it himself. But if you, if necessary, go buy it for him. Okay. Uh, I apologize, Rav. That just a whole lot of these new questions are coming in. Um, there was a question here which I feel I have to relate to in the text here uh, that the, the young girl who we spoke about before said, why am I suffering so much why isn't Hashem saving me if she doesn't think she did anything wrong you should absolutely uh, the mother should absolutely um, support her on that you've done nothing wrong she just needs to hear that over and over and over again you've done nothing wrong so why she needs to suffer, tell her, is an age-old question in humanity. Why do good people suffer? You're a good person. Let's deal with that first, that you're a good person. Okay. Children don't do wrong. And if they did wrong things when they were in adolescence, it's because somebody messed them up when they were kids. They don't do things that are wrong. Okay. Um, there's a follow-up to the question we asked about the Kedrachs before, about you said about the Hataras and the Dharam. Um, the spouse who is not eating Kedrachs, okay, um, they, they don't want to eat Kedrachs. In other words, they don't want to make a hataras and dharam per se, but okay. the the other spouse is eating kabrachs at the table. Do we have to worry about? And the reason the the kabrachs was entered into the house to begin with was because they were told to be able to give to the child whatever they needed to eat, whether it was kabrachs or kidneys. Right. Do we have to worry about the kalim? Do we have no to worry- no. Even if the other, even if the spouses started to eat kabrachs themselves, 
Right. What, what do you mean? So the other, you start asking about the other spouse who still right. does not eat the box. Does Correct. he have to worry about the Caleb? If he's worried, if he was always Mahmimika Din on the Caleb, so you should do a Torah Snedorim on the Caleb, that he's not in Israel anymore on Caleb, just on the, on the Chiva. Okay. I want to make sure we get all the questions I could possibly get to. Okay, I think we just answered that question. Um, okay, so we answered those questions. Um, a piece of advice question. Right now, there is a seems to be a disagreement, uh, a disconnection between a mother and a child. Is there a way to approach a child who isn't talking to the mom to let them know that they are very welcome and wanted at the Seder? And specifically, that child will not sit at a table where the mother is sitting. She likes her siblings. How can we approach it? Is there a way to approach to see if we can get this them sitting at the table together. The mother wants the child at the table. The child will not sit at the table with the mother. But she likes, the child likes the, likes the siblings. So, you know, it's, it just seems to be a disconnection between mother and child. So she wants to figure out a way of she, something she can say or do to get her daughter to agree that she could sit at the table with her. Correct. I don't know. I would ask a therapist that question, but uh, I would think that the, the most healing part, the, the best of all, the, you know, between a rock and a hard place, we would say, listen, the siblings and you, we can have a great time together. I know it's hard for you to sit at the table with me. I'll sit in the kitchen and I'll watch you guys and I'll enjoy being together with you from a little bit of a distance, so not to make you uh, uncomfortable. See if that works, but uh, that, that, I, don't, I don't know. That's beyond my pay, my pay grade. I would ask a therapist if there's a way to do that. Sounds like she in the anger stage that she's in, that it's uh, not a doable thing. That's what it sounds to me like. So obviously, then you can't put any pressure on her to do that. But that's a, that's a good thing. You got to send that to Rabbi Russell that question. Uh-huh. Remember the cloud, we have to put aside our personal nigias. What's the best way to help this child get reconnected to the house, to the home, to the family? If by forcing my presence on her in a place where she can't handle it, doing that is going to disconnect her even more at this stage in time. It's going to disconnect her more. The other kids you have to worry about also. You're a parent of all, all, all your children, so you have to find a way of uh, appeasing them, talking to them ahead of time. Listen, if I sit at the table, the girl or whoever the sister is, or the brother, whoever made the is, is ill. They're not there. They have an emotional illness, mental illness, and uh, they're going through an anger stage of anger. And you can't reason with them. You can't talk with them. Um, I want to enjoy the time with you. I can't sacrifice either one of you. Can't sacrifice her. Can't sacrifice you. So, is there a way we can do this that nobody gets terribly hurt? Everybody's going to have to give up here. Something you to have to sit down with the with the other kids and, and talk to them about it. I, but you can't do something. Expect her to just comply and sit at the table when she hates to be there for you. She's too angry right now. Okay. Um, offer, offer another place if you can, or offer the other siblings another place. You, know, you have to find a workaround solution. You cannot force her to stay at the table. A uh, question about Mavushal wine uh, at its Seder table with regards to the non Shomer Shabbos children. How do we handle that? A non-mavushal wine or mavushal wine? Non-mavushal wine. 
That would be the. Uh, Why don't you buy Mavusha wine? But it, Mika Din, you could be Mako. Mika Din, you Mako. But it's, it's, uh, it would be a hither to buy Mavusha wine. He's grape juice that's at least pasteurized. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, another kind of quick one. There wouldn't, there wouldn't be Mahalo Shabbos if the uh, Rav walked into the house. Big Rav, would they be Mahal Shabbos in front of the Rav? Probably not. So they don't have a Dina Mahal Shabbos in front of the Rav. So I think the next question would be probably a two part question. Um, what do you say to a child? Um, we're talking, of course, again, Bar Bas Mitzvah, above Bar Bar Mitzvah, Bar Bas Mitzvah, who doesn't want to finish their Kazayas. I'm okay. going. To, I'm going to ask the question in two parts. Um, I'm going to add on to this because we have our kips, as we call them, our kids in pain, and we have our regular chinuch kids. So, kids in pain question: Do we mention it or say anything to them about the kazayas, or are we just very happy that they're in the table and eating whatever they're eating? Just give, I always give directions before the, you get to Moitzi Matzah. How much people, what is the mitzvah? How much do you need to eat? And if it's hard for you, you can add a little water in your mouth so it helps you chew it so it's not so hard to swallow it. And that's it. The rest is up to them. That's that's true of all the kids. If they think they haven't eaten enough, they'll ask you and then you, you look at it and you say, well, maybe a little bit more. <coughs> okay. So you say one time and that's it. That's it. Okay. And they can eat it with any share of time that they want. I mean, it, it doesn't take long to eat and half an egg. Think of a half an egg worth of matzah. You know, it, he can finish it in, in two minutes, but even if it takes him five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten minutes, also okay. Just don't waste time. They should just eat it in a way they're not wasting time. Um, Somebody keeps asking who who is who is the piece about is Botano Hitzil. That that's for, that's from me. Okay. Does is a simple question. The the, the Piasetsna says something similar. Piasetsna says something similar to that, but not to, not in the same not the same, same way. way. Okay. All right. Um, if the person is running the he's an adult kip. Person is an adult kid. <laughs> okay. okay. Uh, and he feels himself to be a Ben Russia. Oh, and boy. He, but at least he's still sitting at the table and he's still being shown with Torah Mitzvahs as best as his ability. But there are so many of these... He's a giver. He's a so many of these ancestor Chumras that he's got all the way going, going back. It was a Chumras upon Chumras. And he just wants to drop them. He doesn't want to do the, he can't do the chumras anymore. He wants to be able to hold, you make her a din. Um, does he need to do a hataras? Can he drop them? Or does he need to? It'd be better to do hataras in the door. I mean, if he, if he, if he's been doing them, uh, you know, for a significant amount of time over and over again, it'd be better to do hataras in the door. If it's something new, he could just drop it probably. But uh, it's not a big deal, hataras in the door. If he'll call, if he'll, the person will call me up, he doesn't even have to identify him. I'll do it over the phone. I don't even have to know his name. Because yeah, he, he feels that these chumras are pushing him away. Just it's 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 just hurting. He's him. all right. He should drop all of them. It's preferable to do atoras nadorim. If he can't do atoras nadorim for whatever reason, so he can rely on the atoras nadorim that he did erev rosh hashanah. Especially if, if he's worried about it and doesn't want to do atoras nadorim now. So this coming era of Rosh Hashanah, you should just have in mind, it says in the Nusuch there, all the minhogim, all the things that I was knowing, and I didn't say bleed nether, a big mother, just have that in mind. It'd be better to ask a rope specifically and do it one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. But uh, if not, he has in mind era of Rosh Hashanah, and he probably had it in mind anyway, era of Rosh Hashanah this time. So if he can't do that, Rosh Hashanah, we can be saying on that. Okay. Then I got a follow-up question to right before. When we say chinuch, and he should get some therapy. I hope he's getting therapy. If he's an adult kip, he should be getting therapy. 
Sorry about that. Seems my dog had some questions. Um, okay, does Kenneth, does there's a follow up question? Does Kenneth mean that they have to make sure the kids do mitzvahs? No. Oh, no, no, no. Somebody, turn off the. Yeah. No, it doesn't mean you have to make them do mitzvahs. That's called koifin ala mitzvahs. Basting can make fear, can make people do mitzvahs, but that's not the din of chinuch. That's a din of basting, which anyway, basting doesn't do that anymore for different reasons. But no, chinuch means preparation. You teach them how they could do the mitzvah, how they should do the mitzvah when they become an adult. And it doesn't include prohibitions. Chinuch is not teaching them not to do something. Chinuch is only teaching them what to do. Mitzvah sasei, not mitzvah slo sasei. You teach them how to do it. Part of teaching is habituation. So when they're young, we get them to do it according to their age on a daily basis or week or whatever that particular mitzvah is so that they're habituated. And they're prepared to do the mitzvah when they become bar mitzvah, but it's not forcing them. And certainly after bar mitzvah, certainly there's no din like that. The din of chinuch doesn't apply. That din of chinuch of teaching them how to do the mitzvah doesn't apply after they become bar bas mitzvah. After bar bar mitzvah, the part of chinuch that's left is giving them hadrocha, giving them hadrocha, advice, aids and musa in the right way. But the mitzvahs are their own deal then. That's their own responsibility. Till the bar bas mitzvah, you teach them how to do the mitzvahs and help them become habituated to mitzvahs. Only mitzvahs are say, not mitzvahs los are say. And uh, after bar mitzvah, the, the dean of chinuch is contracted into just teaching them, not teaching them, but giving them advice where they need it and guiding them where, where they need it, giving them if they're helping them to work on their mitzvahs and things like that. Um, I see one more question here. Um, we were discussing before that you know you can drink if, if a person is eating their kezayas. Um, I'm going to add on to this because that's what it sounds to me. Is that a person is eating their kezayas? We said, and if they're having a hard time, they can drink a little bit of water to help. Water, just them. water, nothing else. Nothing. No chocolate. No chocolate. No chocolate spread on their matzah. If no, no. Just water. Just water. Nice. Right, so um, let me just see this question here again. Okay, so we know this child, actually, let me add on a little bit more to this question. This particular child that uh, we're discussing here is a struggling child. If you can put on the, if you put on the chocolate spread onto the, to the matzah and he'll be able to eat and he'll end up eating the kezayas because of it, Will that be, will he be, you know, you say, will he be, will he get the mitzvah of eating the kezayis of matzah? Or will it be like, is he nothing? Probably, probably not. But why do you have to put the, I mean, it, this sounds if like. He put, a, if they put I, the chocolate. After, I, after, 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 if, if the child wants to eat the matzah, it's, again, we're talking about a small amount of matzah. You can even a third of a kezayis. Make a din a third of a kezayis. A third of a beitz, excuse me. A third of a beitzah. How much matzah are we talking about? The reason it becomes difficult is because you people eat, you know, half of a hand matzah. Give them this much, this much ma this much matzah, this much matzah. Put your two hands together, overlap the fingers a little bit. That much matzah. That's a third of a beitzah. You don't have to put anything on it. You know, let's get uh, serious. If he wants to do the mitzvah, say, "This is the mitzvah, sweetie. Here, can you eat this much?" There's nobody in the world who can't eat that much. If they say, I cannot, I'll choke, I'll die, because then to, hey, to put the chocolate spread on the table and say, you can do what you want. Okay. Okay, you answered. Okay. I believe you answered that if anybody, one. If anybody has any doubts about the size of the kazais, just take your average medium-sized egg, crack it down the middle, Crush up a piece of matzah in your hand. You don't have to turn it into powder in a blender. Crush it up into a bit and see how much, how big the piece of matzah will fit into half of the eggshell. 
And this you got your kazayas there. And if that's too much, then you go down to a third, third of the egg. It's nothing. It's 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 a very small amount of food. Uh let's see if this is going to be okay. Hopefully the rub has a few more minutes. If the kip is coming to the table, dress on stick. And from the past, and, and in the past, um, from past experience, you know you can't say anything. What do you do? What should I do? Because of the brachas, you mean? Because of brachas. Right. So for the brachas, yes. as long as they're not right in your face and you're looking into the sitter, you can say all the brachas. Look in the Haggadah when you say the bracha and say the, say the brachas. Just make sure you're looking in the Haggadah and not anywhere When you else. say the bracha, just look in the Haggadah. Yeah. Um, last chance for anybody to throw out a question. Otherwise, I'm letting the Rubs give himself a few minutes here to say thank you very much. And in the meantime, I'm going to be putting a new link into the uh, into the chat. I hope everybody has a chance to look at it. And thank Rav, Rav Schwartz. Thank you so much. For uh, to everybody, to everybody at the Seder and with the rest of your uh, involvement with your kips and keeping them part of your home. That's the big, the big requirement of the Seder is this botein uhitzil, save your families. Kol tov. Kol tov. Thank you so much, Rob Schwartz. And a chag kosher v'sameach. Chag kosher v'sameach. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you very much. You're all Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.